<laughs> so, I'm still Nathan Acuff. Um, I do a little short, I, I say it's five minutes, but I have a feeling I run over every week um, where I pick some random weird gym that I've used in the previous month and make all of you listen to me talk about it. Um, this month, the gym I've selected is Rescue Mongo, which is a gym I wrote, and the talk is definitely going to run way over five minutes. Um, yeah, so that's that's who I am, and that's what we're doing. Um, following Matt's fine example, this is the first picture that comes up if you search for Mongo Gym. It's too bad because the second image is this little cartoon that would have been much better, but no, we've got model trains. Um, but really, whoever put this thing together, I mean, if you look at the detail of those trees, that's pretty impressive. He's obviously serious about his craft. So, getting back on topic, uh, Rescue Mongo. Um, this is a table of contents. I hate people who read their slides, so I got a couple things I'm going to talk about. First of all, why didn't we just use all of the other things that are available to do background jobs? You know, any web application, once you reach a certain size, inevitably you reach a point where you have something that takes longer than, say, half a second to do, and you need some sort of background job. Uh, we have a system that processes a lot of things. We're still using it for some things. It's based on Starling and Worklink, which is Twitter's vaguely memcache-based queuing system. It works pretty well, but you reach a certain point where it doesn't scale real well. There are times where we can have 200, 300, 400,000 jobs in the queue, and that's, that's normal. That's okay. It's not a failure condition. Starling, once you get above about 100, that's, you need to do something about that. That indicates that there's a problem. With what we're doing, it's not necessarily a problem. Um, we chose not to use something like Rescue because we already had a Mongo server, so we didn't want to add another server to our infrastructure. Uh, we wanted to try to take advantage of something we already had in place. And we looked at Amazon SQS, since basically everything we do is at EC2. Um, SQS has some latency concerns that, frankly, we we may yet use it for something, but uh, we didn't want to take the risk because the deadline for getting this thing working was just absurdly tight. So the code. I don't know if you all remember, uh, David Christiansen has an application called Daibatsu where you can go and vote on which punishment for your children is the most egregious. Um, I couldn't make that up if I tried. So here's his application. Um, I've put a couple things in here, um, so you can choose. Um, okay, I'm going to vote for these things. Is there are these are these punishments appropriate? So sending bed to dinner, yeah, that's sometimes appropriate. Extra chores, kids should always have chores. Making them watch the Super Bowl halftime show is pretty <laughs> harsh. Um, so that's the application. Um, very simple. Um, I'm going to pretend that there's something that needed some background work. So I've added the uh, Daibatsu Integrated Punishment Simulator. As we all know that sending your children to uh, IPS is just about the worst thing I can imagine for them. So um, the idea here is that you put in a punishment and the system has a very accurate simulation or like an orphanage somewhere where they're actually doing these things. And you can determine, uh, based on a computer simulation, how bad the punishment's going to be. The problem is, if I uh, look at our code, oh god, what is it? I always forget. Apple Plus. Hey, there we go. Problem is, you look at this code, uh, simulate is, uh, first of all, you can see it's a very accurate computer simulation. Um, but it also takes a long time. So if I go in here and hit uh, simulate, and I forgot to clear out my database, so don't worry about the rest of this page. Um, it takes its sweet time, and eventually you get a result, but that's, that's just way too long. So um, I've got the rescue gym loaded up in here, and uh, let's see what we would have to do to simulate that. So. I'm going to enqueue a rescue job. Uh, you give it the name of the class that you're queuing up, and then any arguments you want to use, you can just give it a hash. So let's do, uh, I think it wants this. 
Uh, tell it which thing I'm simulating. Um, I'm going to have to look at my cheat sheet real quick because I forget. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that'll enqueue the job. To actually process it using rescue, uh, it expects you to define this self.perform. Um, for what we're using, it basically always takes just a normal options hash. You can actually pass it an array. Um, the rules are pretty loose, except if you want any of our special features that I'll get to in a minute. Um, the first thing should be a hash because there are some special keys it expects. And it has to be something that will serialize to BSON, which is basically anything that will serialize to JSON. So pretty, pretty easy rules. Um, uh, simulation, uh, find, options. Um, Mongo will turn all of your symbols into strings for you. It's a nice bonus feature that you get while you're using Mongo. It doesn't know what symbols are, so everything comes back that way. Um, and let's just, you know, put our code and, uh, and, uh, save it. Yeah. So that should, uh, pretty much do the same thing. I'll go back over here and have it simulate the Super Bowl halftime show. And, oh, I forgot some code. So you can have multiple classes share queues in Rescue, and as long as they're using the same features, it, they all work together pretty well. Um, the original Rescue is something that the guys at GitHub wrote, and they named their queues like high priority, critical priority, low priority, and archival priority. Um, we tend to arrange ours by class, just because we only have four kinds of things that go on the queue, and they have vastly different requirements. So I think that's what I... Okay, so do that, and uh, let's simulate. So you can see, um, I just had it spit out whatever's in the queue down there. Um, there's our, there's the job waiting. Um, I left out the submitted by, but who cares? Uh, so to run these things. Um, let's make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, oh, what queue you want? Uh, get more of my window on the screen. Uh, you have to tell it to run your environment job first. And that should pretty much do it. So that'll kick off and it's, it's probably working. Uh, there's a log somewhere if you really want to know, but well, I'll definitely consume those jobs. Yeah, well, they're going somewhere. I probably have an error. This is what's great about these live demos. I swore I wasn't gonna just copy paste code around. I was gonna try to do it live to show how easy it was. And then, and then here we are. So that didn't work. Um, is it the what? Oh yeah, hey, that's not gonna work. Thanks, buddy. Um, so I'll restart that. And uh, let's queue up another job here. There, come on. Yeah, it's running. Well, it still didn't work. So, <clears throat> It is kind of annoying that uh, you have to find self.perform. You can't just have a method on the class. So uh, let's just do this. And uh, I'll just uh, cut that out of there. And do one of them. And. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. It's not saving it before it uh, does the thing. Yeah. But that ought to work. 
Am I? Oh yeah. Well, that's really bad. Yeah, that's. I am really good at this. You're just giving opportunities. Yeah. I'll be a quiz later. So let's do that, and then. Uh, and uh, maybe more like that. Huh? Oh, yeah. So that might work. I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's give it a whirl. Now, it may take five seconds here. No. Hey, there we go. Hey! Oh, I'm still a programmer. I get to keep my job. So, that's um, really, despite my many misfirings, um, that's not that bad for getting your code to run in the background like that. Um, you can use something like God to monitor all of your jobs. You can have it spin off multiple workers, do multiple queues. Um, it's pretty easy to set up and the code, aside from splitting things up into some different methods, really doesn't change very much. So that is Rescue Mongo, and if you've used Rescue, that looks really, really familiar. <clears throat> but we did some other stuff. Oh, yeah. We did some other stuff. I don't know why I even have a slide, because I'm going right back to the code. Um, we have some new features. So one of them is you can have a unique queue where the job, you give the job a unique ID, and if you've used Mongo before, um, they look, you know, they're pretty much, uh, let's see what I called this thing down here. You know what, I'm just going to cheat and grab this whole line because I'm really lazy. So, um, this underscore ID is, a, is that's always the primary key in Mongo. So I'm going to give this thing a, uh, I grabbed the wrong lines. No, my window is just too big. Hey, there we go. So giving it the, the unique key means that every time you try to enqueue another job with that key, it'll just modify the arguments in place in your queue instead of creating a new job with those arguments, which is something that you really never ever need to do. And then, but when you need it, there's really no substitute for that functionality. Um, it was something that turned out to be really important for us. Most of the time you want to enqueue a second job, but if it's a really long running job, if it's something that's not gonna get run until overnight, um, if you're, for us, if you're rolling up user histories, you can just keep accumulating arguments and then when it runs, most of the cost is incurred just by having the job run. So you get all, all the arguments you can in there. Um, and to enable this, um, you set, yeah. Uh, unique jobs, and you set that key. And let's see if this works. So it, there's nothing to see that it's working, but trust me, it's not adding new jobs there. Um, that's, it only ever added one job and I clicked that thing like 10 times. So that's pretty handy. Um, we also do uh, scheduled jobs or delayed jobs. Uh, let's do that. That's another one of these special keys. You just set uh, delay until, and let's do, I don't know, like two minutes, something like that. Um, there's another quick little thing that we'd love to get rid of, but unfortunately we haven't yet. So uh, you have to tell Rescue that this, this queue allows delayed jobs to exist within the queue. And it's the one, the one rule about having multiple jobs, jobs and job types living in the same queue. You can't have scheduled jobs and non-scheduled jobs share a queue. 
for anything else, pretty much it's, it's the Wild West, but you don't want those two things to mix. Um, it does remember which of your cues are delayed. You really only need to call this function once ever, like ever, and it'll work. Uh, we call it like in one of our initializers. Um, I'm gonna throw it here because it's fast and I'm not very good at programming. Um, I will need to restart the job. And you can see it's got the delay until in the queue. And it consumed it immediately. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's what you want. Yep, that's interesting. That's more of a general Mongo question, but I see you're building your unique key there. Do yeah. you find that you do that a lot, or do you? Um, so most of our, like what we use this feature for is, is um, so that we can do session expiration without enabling sessions in our Rails app. So every time the user does something, we push back the schedule time for this job to 20 minutes from now. So we're constantly pushing the, their session expiration job back until they don't hit the website anymore and then it rolls up and it goes. Um, so for that, like the ID is just a user ID that we already have laying around. Um, most of the time for those IDs, like you'll, you'll have something that's natural that, that goes in there. Uh, if you don't, Mongo will happily give you an ID that's like a 12 digit number or something. Um, you know, we tend to use UUIDs for a lot of stuff. Um, for most Mongo stuff, it, it'll either your ID will be real obvious or you'll use the one that Mongo gives you. You don't have to construct them like this unless you're doing an example that's not working very well. And why isn't it working very well? Um, I'm going to restart this. Any other questions while I'm bumbling my way through this? Is the time that gets displayed actually two minutes in the future? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so these new features that you've added, are you going to or have you patched that thing in the back into the original rescue? Um, we have not. Unfortunately, they, and this is one of the reasons we used Mongo. Um, hey, it's delaying. Um, one of the reasons we chose Mongo is with Redis, the amount of inspection you can do on objects that are in a collection in Redis is, may as well be zero. Um, Mongo lets you have some, some indexes and do much deeper inspection of your objects. Ooh, still delaying. Um, so these features would be much more difficult to implement on Rescue. I know that there is a scheduled delay job um, plugin for, for Rescue that works pretty well. Um, with the kind of load we were pushing, we looked at the implementation and it just wasn't going to work for us. So, unfortunately, we can't really port a lot of this back. Um, you know, at first we started off saying, what if we define a separate back end? But some of the changes we were making and some of these new things are so, so radical that it just wasn't, wasn't feasible and especially not in the time we had. Um, well, two minutes was too long, but... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully we see another Black Eyed Peas pop up at some point here. I'll go back to my slides. I <coughs> like slides. So, yeah, these are our new features. Um, and I gave away, you know, like 80% of our company's secret there. We do sessions without sessions. It's, it's, it's magical. Um, and there are plenty of other applications we've come up with for, for using these things. I mean, everybody wants delayed jobs. Um, Nope, nobody wants to have to go out to Cron and rely on that to do your nightly <coughs> stuff. So, Act 3. I'll stand back up for this. <coughs> so, we stopped using Rescue Mongo uh, about a month after we finished writing it. And that seems really silly and like a gross misapplication of time. The problem is that our production load for the application that was using Rescue Mongo, um, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, it was over 12,000 RPM pretty regularly, uh, and that's bad. Um, Mongo's, the, the way that this works, there's a function in Mongo called find and modify, which is basically give me the object as it exists right now, and let don't let anybody else get it until you apply 
these rules. And the rule we're applying is removed or removed from that queue. Unfortunately, doing sort of that, that random remove, that find one object and then remove it in Mongo, is not as fast as it needed to be. And Mongo is not good at reclaiming that space. Um, it turns out that dropping a whole collection, in some cases, is faster than removing one item from a collection. And that's just a Mongoism that we weren't aware of, but we are very aware of right now. Um, our solution to that was, well, we had a bunch of awesome code names. I've put the best ones up here. Um, Hydra, the idea was we were going to split into multiple queues. So there would be, in this case, eight simulation queues. And we would start like one worker on each of our worker machines for each of the queues. So hopefully then the queues would stay smaller and our, our locks would be, would be distributed a little bit better. Uh, it didn't work out that way because Mongo's locking mechanism, until Mongo 2.0 comes out this summer, let's hope everybody go vote on that JIRA ticket for me and I'll, I'll buy you something nice. Um, until they implement better separation of locks across collections, it's going to be a problem. And we're going to talk about that more later. I know it, that's the most boring and non-Ruby related thing um, so far. So it's bad, trust me. Um, the rotator, the idea was we would have like an hourly queue. So all the simulations that were triggered between 7 and 8 would go into one queue. And instead of doing find and modify, we could just do a, like a find and update. It would be a little bit quicker, mark all those as done. And once everything in an hourly queue was done, we could drop that collection because it's much faster. We never got around to implementing that. Uh, ultimately, what we did was just to change our process and optimize our code to the point where we can run everything um, at web request time. Um, we put a few more things off onto Starling that are really critical and that sometimes lo run long. And a lot of stuff um, using Mongo's fire and forget writes and updates, uh, we were able to just move back to being synchronized. Um, it, was a, it was a terrible week or so, but it, it works pretty well now, um, and unfortunately we can't keep using it. So that being said, I think there's still a great use case for it. Um, for people like us who already have a Mongo installation and you don't want another server to manage, but you do want a single point of control for these things, if you just need a couple of jobs, if you're not pushing 12,000 requests a minute, um, if you were pushing, I mean, up to three or 4,000 requests a minute, it worked fine. There were no problems. Um, in its current state, I think, Four or five thousand is probably the practical ceiling, but if you're pushing, you know, two hundred jobs a minute, you won't even notice the load on Mongo. You you won't have a problem. It'll run all day and be real happy. Um, or if you're willing to implement rotations, that was the idea we actually got from Tengen, who are the people that developed Mongo. Um, they said if you want to make this work, this is how you're going to have to do it until 2.0 comes out. Um, we just didn't have that kind of time. And there, as always, is a picture of my cat. So, any questions? <laughs> that is a bangle. Okay. And she is a, she's just so annoying. <laughs> she's a cat. <laughs> okay. She's a cat. <laughs> Anyone else? What are you upgrading to your thing with that performance? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, you said that you didn't say that you're. Yeah, so some of the jobs that we had moved from Starling, um, we moved back from Starling, and we're just uh, much more careful about in queuing and, and, and monitoring that. Um, we're just we're pushing Starling even a little bit further. Um, a lot of the things, we really changed the implementation of our the user tracking stuff that I mentioned. Um, so we're able to do a lot of that synchronously, or to do, in Mongo, you can call an update that will return if your arguments are valid and then apply your update later. So we use a lot of that. That's still, so it's sort of asynchronous, but we're letting Mongo handle that. Um, next time we need background jobs, we're, we may, we're looking at a couple things. Um, we may go get Rabbit um, or we may go to SQS. Those are the front runners right now. Um, we're just worried about write latency spikes on SQS. Uh, read latency we don't really care about because our background jobs are, we have a window about like 30 seconds before we really want to get them done, so a couple seconds doesn't bother us. But our front end application, the front end of most of our background processing, our average response time is like 15 milliseconds. So we can't afford SQS delays on that. So we're investigating. Um, we were able to program our way out of that hole for a little while. Anyone else? 
Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Amazing.